Great venture. It's awesome to see you guys. This is great. Hey, for those of you who don't know me, my name is John. And uh, as Tim mentioned earlier, I got to serve here as the teaching pastor for a few years. And uh, man, we have missed you guys so much. My wife, Mal, my kids are here with me this weekend. And we just kind of feel like we're back at home for the weekend. And it's just a joy to be here. And uh, Tim might, uh, I didn't know I was going to say this, but um, I just want to thank all of you who have been faithful to this church through COVID, through a senior pastor transition. I was a senior pastor successor out in Indiana where I serve as a lead pastor. And those transitions are difficult on the leader. And you guys in Tim Lundy, your senior pastor, you guys have one of the best leaders in the country. I hope you know that. And I wanna say to those of you who have just stayed faithful through all the ups and downs of transition followed by COVID, thank you. Uh, as you know, if you stay part of a church where Jesus is the head of the church, where his word is taught and where his spirit is the power, God will continue to do miraculous things through all the ups and downs. And so it is just a joy to be back here and see the work of God continuing to thrive uh, four and a half years after God called me out to Indiana. Well, hey, I know some of you don't know me at all, so let's start talking about something that we all have in common. And it's this, we all want the best for the people we love. In fact, right now, I wonder if you'd think of someone you care about, maybe it's a child, a grandchild, maybe it's a boyfriend, a girlfriend, someone you care about that you just want the best for them. You don't want to see them suffer. You don't want to see them have to go through cancer or disease. You don't want to see them deal with injustice or, or with, with, with any kind of pain in life. Who, who's that person that you'd think of? Uh, for me, I think of my family and specifically, I think of my two daughters. Here's my daughters, Zoe and Evie. And uh, Zoe's on the left, Evie's on the right. And uh, they're about the best thing that has ever happened to me. They are just the sweetest, sweetest girls. And they're still at that age where they think that I know everything and they think that I'm so strong and so smart. And you know, some of you who have teenagers have, have warned me that maybe that changes, I guess, as they get a little bit older, but I'm just loving it. You know, Zoe and Evie, they uh, live in a world full of stuffed animals and dolls. So their bedroom is, is almost like this zoo collection of animals and dolls. And uh, as an outsider, you'd look and you'd just think, wow, that's a lot of stuffed animals and dolls. But every single one has a name. Every single one has a place. And Zoe and Evie, they will play and they'll create these uh, elaborate imaginary scenarios you know, where their dolls are solving a problem or uh, one of their stuffed animals is overcoming some obstacle. Uh, and I've noticed that in their world, the obstacles are, are pretty benign, are pretty small compared to the things we deal with. I've noticed there's, there's not a lot of um, disease, there's not a lot of racism, there's not a lot of all out injustice in their world. It's a pretty comfortable little world. Um, and yet there is one villain. You see, Zoe and Evie, they have an older brother, Jack. And uh, Jack's a good guy, don't get me wrong. He's got a great heart, but he's the only boy in the house. And uh, he's more into things like dragons, T-Rexes. And every once in a while, Zoe and Evie, they'll have their whole little world set up and it'll just be perfectly controlled and their little dream life is happening and then a dragon or a T-Rex will attack out of nowhere and will just destroy the villagers and everything there. <laughs> the other day this happened and one of my daughters came to me in tears and she said, Dad, I just feel like everything I've been working for is ruined. <laughs> and it was a cute moment, it was a tender moment, but it was also one of those moments where it was almost kind of prophetic because she was saying that and I was thinking of my friends who are struggling with disease or whose businesses are struggling or who are going through divorce or who are dealing with injustice or with racism. And I thought, man, isn't that a word for all of us adults? I just feel like everything I was working for 
is ruined. I wonder, do you ever feel like that? I mean, if you're really paying attention to what's going on in the world between global wars and hunger and disease and moral decisions that countries are making that harm people, if you're paying attention, there's days that you just feel like, man, everything we're working for is being torn apart. Justice is being torn apart. I watch my girls and they're always looking for a hero then who can come in after the dragon or the T-Rex to clean everything back up. And here's what I know about you, even if I haven't met you before, I know that you wanna help the people around you. That person that you thought of earlier, the child, the grandchild, the niece, the nephew, the boyfriend, the girlfriend, the spouse, you wanna help them when a dragon of some kind has come into their lives. We all want to help but we look at how big the world is and we start to think, how could I make any difference? I mean, these problems, COVID, cancer, politics, deception, they're so big. They're so beyond us and our hearts break, but how could we really make a difference? And when the sickness of humanity grieves you, you might wonder this question, how can you be a force for good in a world that is so broken and hurting. Now, if I could tell you today, not just as a thought exercise, but in a meaningful, measurable, practical way, how you can be part of the solution to whatever pains you in the world, would you wanna know how? Would you wanna know how you can use your life to not just complain about what's wrong in the world, but to actually fix what's wrong in the world. Well, believe it or not, God answers this question for us. And I wanna share with you God's answer today. And while we'll look into the word of God, because that's where God speaks, God's answer on this from his word is actually a mosaic of lives. People just like you and me, who've gone out and have actually changed the world for the better. I'll start with a true story of a time when a natural disaster destroyed an entire city. It was the city of Rochester, Minnesota. This was in August of 1883. An F5 tornado tore through Rochester and it was actually one of a series of tornadoes that struck one after another. 37 people were killed, more than 200 people were injured, but far beyond that, thousands lost everything they had. Businesses, homes. All of a sudden there were a whole bunch of orphans, a whole bunch of widows. The city infrastructure was destroyed. Now at this time in 1883, there were only three hospitals in all of Minnesota. It was, you know, kind of like a frontier territory. The city of Rochester didn't have a hospital for all these people. And just like whatever grieves you in the world, it was one of those things where you look up from the ashes, from the disaster, from the rubble, and you say, how could I possibly do any good in this? But in the midst of that, God had placed a little woman with a big faith named Mary Mose. Now, Mary had given her life as a follower of Jesus. In fact, you can kind of see in her religious get up here, she was very serious about it. Mary's one of these people who took the words of Jesus so literally when he said, whatever you do for the least of these you've done unto me, that she literally believed that if she was bandaging the wounds of a child who'd been hit by shrapnel in a tornado, that she was bandaging the wounds of Jesus. I mean, she was an all out Jesus follower. She had come from a family of resources and she had left behind her inheritance and everything else to just love people for Jesus to give out cups of cold water, to care for the orphans and the widow. She took the words in the book of James, that's a book in the Bible, where uh, one of the disciples of Jesus says, true religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to care for the widows and the orphans in their affliction. Mary Mose did not have a big strategic plan to change the world, but she had an obedience to really believe what Jesus says. If a follower of Jesus is supposed to care for the poor, for the orphans, for the widows, that's what I'm gonna do. And so that's what she started to do. And as she uh, put together this makeshift place where all these injured people could get together, she found the town doctor. And she said, I, I really think we need, to, um, we need to start an actual hospital here. 
And he said, no, Rochester's not big enough for a hospital. It can only handle one doctor's clinic. There's no way I don't have enough nurses and we don't have enough funding. Mary Mose said, okay, challenge accepted. <laughs> she went out and she found a bunch of these other women who had given their lives to Jesus. And she shows up with about 30 of them. And she says to the doctor, I've solved your nursing problem. And he said, okay, great. You still don't have money for a hospital. So they start going around, not just Rochester, all the surrounding areas fundraising to start a hospital in Rochester, Minnesota. Takes them a few years to do it. And the doctor whose vision had been much smaller, just a normal doctor's clinic, agreed and got on board with her. And she and these other women of Jesus, they, would, they were the ones moving the bedpans. They were the ones changing the bandages. They were the ones doing the dirty, messy work of caring for people all for free. And this doctor and his little staff there started to grow and they realized they needed a name for their clinic. So they decided to name it after his last name, Mayo, the Mayo Clinic. Their Mayo Clinic continued to grow. And if you were, to go there today, you'd find the number one hospital, not only in the United States, the number one hospital in the world. And if you go to the middle of the Mayo Clinic, you'll find this building, which is called St. Mary's Hospital, named after Mary Mose, this follower of Jesus who had no idea that by her just loving people the way Jesus said with abandon, he would use her to be the spark and the ignition of the most esteemed and most influential hospital in all of human history. God used an ordinary person, just like you, just like me, to bring millions to health because she believed in Jesus and she joined his cause. Now you might be thinking, okay, John, great story, but I'm never gonna start a hospital. I'm just an ordinary person. That is my point. Mary Mose was just an ordinary person, but here's the thing, she actually believed the words of Jesus. And here's our big idea today that we're gonna see in the word of God. God uses ordinary people who believe Jesus. Those are the three functional words of this sentence. Do you believe Jesus? If so, God can use you in this world to do extraordinary good. God uses ordinary people who actually believe Jesus to do extraordinary good. Now, I know as I'm sharing this message for those of you online, for those here in the room, that there are at least two different kinds of people listening to this. Some of you aren't sure yet what you believe. You're not sure if you even believe in Jesus. And I just wanna encourage you, stay with me this week and next week. I was where you are at one point in my life. That's why one of my books is called Jesus Skeptic, because I started as a skeptic. So if you're here and you're not sure what you believe, I just wanna challenge you this. Will you give it an honest consideration? Will you actually consider some of these facts without prejudice? Now, if you're here and you would say, I am a Christian or I am a follower of Jesus, I wanna ask you right now to invite the Holy Spirit to speak to you and really answer this question. Do my life actions indicate that I really believe the words of Jesus? Not just mentally I've agreed, but the way I spend my time, the way I spend my resources and my energy, I'm living like someone who actually believes Jesus. Now here's the question for all of us, what kind of tornado are you in? Mary Mose found herself in the debris of a literal F5 tornado. What is it that's grieving your heart? Is it the moral direction of the country? Is it decisions your kids or grandkids are making? Uh, is it yourself growing up as a young person trying to figure out who am I? Maybe you're in the tornado of identity, figuring out who you are in this world. What tornado are you in? And here's the reality, God can take a tornado, even one that killed 37 people, and he can turn that destruction into a hospital that saves hundreds of thousands of lives and invents medical principles that save millions of lives if, just one person will show up and actually believe the words of Jesus. No matter the debris or the wreckage in your life, if you will believe the words of Jesus, you can in time see God bring good even from a tornado. 
Now, uh, Pastor Tim mentioned earlier that I used to work as a journalist. I was actually an investigative reporter, which is essentially a professional skeptic. <laughs> My full-time job was to be skeptical of everyone and everything. And I had this old saying, wherever there's money, I can find corruption. Just give me enough time. I was in a deeply, I still am a deeply skeptical person. And you might think, well, how did you become a pastor? It was by demanding the truth. And I, in my quest for truth, saw some things that surprised me. One of them, when I was in the midst of a number of stories about medical uh, practice, actually stories that Tom Brokaw and Charles Gibson awarded some National Journalism Awards to, I started to notice all these hospitals that are the top hospitals in the country are called St. Joseph's, St. Mary's, Baptist this, Methodist this, Catholic that. And I'm thinking, why do all these hospitals have Christian terms? I mean, we need a little diversity among the hospitals. Why aren't some of them atheist hospitals? Why aren't some of them other world religion hospitals? And I began investigating the foundation of the best hospitals in our nation. And as a skeptic, I found stories like Mary Moe's over and over and over again. Her story, the founding of the Mayo Clinic, the number one hospital in the world, is not an anomaly or an aberration or an exception. It's the norm. Well, I'll just briefly talk about a couple of the other top five hospitals in the country. Massachusetts General Hospital. When I dug into its foundings, you know who started it? Two pastors who wanted to care for the poor and the widows. And they were going to a Bible seminary that at the time was a Bible-believing seminary called Harvard. And right next to Harvard in Boston, they started a hospital for the poor. That became Massachusetts General, third top hospital in the U.S. How about Johns Hopkins University and Hospital? Started from a Quaker Christian businessman, single dude. At the end of his life, he has a fortune. And he says, I'm going to do what they taught me in Sunday school growing up. I'm going to leave my money. He wanted to help uh, orphans from slavery. He wanted to help uh, the sick. And so he started a hospital. And he wanted to help society. So he started a university. That's where Johns Hopkins University and Hospital comes from. I could go on and on as a nerd. But as a journalist, I started to see this isn't just the case in history, this is the case today. Uh, for example, my editor sent me, I was in Arizona, down to the border where immigrants uh, cross on foot through the desert, desperate for a better life. And while there's you know, all sorts of you know, conflict and I'm not here to talk about the political thing of that, what I found there is these people because a couple hundred bake to death every year in the desert there, like literally just die of heat. And I found these people who would put these jugs of water out. And as I talked to them, they said, well, we actually believe it's illegal. They shouldn't be doing it. But more important than that is they shouldn't die. And so we are given our lives to make sure that they don't die from lack of water. And I said, why would you do that? They said, well, we're followers of Jesus. I met another woman in Phoenix. She was an inheritor, an old money wealth inheritor. She sold everything she had. She bought an entire city block of Phoenix and she created this entire compound where kids who were growing up in gangs, kids who didn't have a good strong family or an identity and would most likely end up dealing drugs, they could come into this compound and it was like an orphanage, but it was more than that. They would learn life skills. They would get an education. And I said, why did you sell your entire fortune? And not, why are you doing this? She said, it's because I'm a follower of Jesus. It led me to study Jesus more for myself. I had been raised to believe in Jesus and I had kind of turned away because I just wasn't sure, is it true? Is it trustworthy? Did the guy really live? And between all that, it forced me to answer the question, did this guy actually live? Do we know what he actually said? Because I keep running into people who are doing insane good in the world and they say that it's Jesus who motivates them. I spent about a week researching the historicity of Jesus and I won't do a whole message on it because it's so well documented. Now, I show the evidence that I found in my book, Jesus Skeptic. If you doubt the historicity of Jesus, uh, I'd encourage if you just spend about a week doing research, you'll find he's one of the most documented people in all of human history. 
Uh, if you don't believe that Jesus lived, then you can't believe that Plato or Socrates or Aristotle or pretty much anyone else from the ancient world lived. So then my next question was this, do we actually know what this guy said? It's clear that he lived. You don't have to be religious or spiritual or believe in God to know that Jesus of Nazareth lived, well documented. Now, do we know what he actually said? So I started to look into the recordings of Jesus' words, which are primarily found in the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and some in the book of Acts. Here's what I found. I found that we have thousands of ancient manuscripts like this. This is a picture of a papyrus of the book of Acts. And I found that if you look at Socrates or Plato or Aristotle, you'll find that within about a hundred years of when they lived, we maybe have one copy of things written down. And then the others are, are, are much more recent, but no one questions the validity of those. And yet I found with these ancient papyri, papyruses if you want, that these and other ones written on leather are all throughout the ancient world. They'll find them in the desert sands in Egypt. They'll find them in caves in Italy. And there's not just one or two. There are literally thousands of these ancient copies. And when you have thousands of copies, you'd expect that they don't really line up, but people have spent the last 400 years lining them all up. And they've found that about 98% of the words agree. In other words, if we're gonna believe that when we read Socrates or Plato or Aristotle, we're reading what they wrote, then we have to believe that the gospels are what Jesus said. So you don't need any faith in the supernatural or a God or anything to simply acknowledge the facts this guy lived. We have records of what he said. So now the natural thing, if we're being curious, is what did he say? And I wanna take you into one of his final conversations with his followers. And he said this, by the way, at this time, his followers, there were 11 disciples, one had abandoned them, Judas. There were maybe about a hundred other followers of Jesus. They were hiding for their lives. They were social outcasts. They were not landowners. They had no political power. And he makes this claim that when I read it, my heart leapt as a nerd because it's a measurable claim. He says this, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Please don't zone out in churchiness. These are real words spoken by a real person who's well-documented, who lived. And he says to his ragtag followers, the very spirit of God is gonna come upon you and you're gonna go and tell people about me in Jerusalem. Now that's right where they lived. So that's like saying, you're gonna tell people about me in the Bay Area. Okay, nothing big there, nothing crazy and in Judea and Samaria. Well, that was a long ways away for them. And that was cross culture at a time where cultures were very cloistered off from each other. And then look at how ridiculous this is. If you just look at this from an objective lens, this is a ridiculous prediction. And to the ends of the earth. You few who are kind of hiding under beds and you're afraid of getting arrested, you don't own any land, you don't have a building, you don't have any political power, you have no army, you have no tanks. By the way, they, they didn't even have, you know, printing presses. They didn't even have steam locomotives. They didn't even have flip phones or fax machines. That's how long ago this was. And he says, I mean, think about this. This is a measurable, this is an objective claim. This guy lived 2000 years ago. And he says to his ragtag followers, you're gonna go spread the word about me and it's gonna spread all the way to the ends of the earth. Now, as a nerd, I love this because it's measurable. Here we are 2000 years later and we're on the other side of the earth. And we have, thanks to modern sociology and modern technology, the ability to know where are followers of Jesus today. By the way, just don't miss how audacious of a prediction this is. You know, other people predicted this. Napoleon predicted that he um, would, his followers would cover the globe, didn't happen. Alexander the Great predicted with his army that his, his movement would cover the globe, didn't happen. Adolf Hitler, I mean, even the Soviet Union, which looked so mighty, it didn't even last 100 years. Many people in history have claimed that their movement will spread to the entire world, but it has never come true for a single one of them. So as a journalist, I went to a group that I often work with 
to, to know sociology data. That is, what do people believe? It's called the Pew Research Center. They're the gold standard of objective sociology. It said, where was Christianity in the world when Jesus made this claim? Here's a map. All the blue areas are where there were Christians in the world when Jesus said, my followers will spread to the ends of the earth. There really weren't any measurably. 120 in Jerusalem, it doesn't even show up as a dot. I didn't want to go to a Christian group to ask where are the Christians, because how objective would that be? So I went to the Pew Research Center and I said, where's the data of where Christians are in the world today as of the year 2020? The blue is where Christians are and the darker the blue, the more Christians there are. And there's Christianity in the world today. Every continent has Christians. Even many of these countries that are white, there actually are Christians in those countries. It's just countries where you get killed for being a Christian. So when the Pew Research Center comes in and says, raise your hand if you're a Christian, those people don't raise their hands. But they are, we know there are Christians one by one in each of those countries. Of course, you got Antarctica at the bottom. There's no people down there. So if you're being skeptical about that, okay, what are the chances? Real guy, a peasant prophet, ragtag followers, no army, no political power, no real estate, no wealth. And he says, and we know he said it, you're gonna spread my movement to the ends of the earth. We're 2000 years later and it has happened. By the way, Islam, Hindu, communism, any other world ideology, they are not all worldwide like that. They're more focused in other, in specific regions. In fact, I learned from the Pew Research Center, get this, one out of three people in the world today claims to be a Christian. 2.2 to 2.4 billion out of 7 billion. One out of three people alive today. It is the largest movement ever in human history. And he predicted it. He said, this is gonna happen. It got me thinking as I continued to read his words, well, if Jesus was right about that, and I hope you're not missing how unlikely of a prediction that is. If he was right about that, what if he's right about the other things he said? What if he's right when he said, come to me all you who are weary and burdened and I'll give you rest. What if he's right when he said, I'm the way, the truth and the life. No one gets to God, no one gets to heaven except through me. What if he's right about that too? What if he's right that someday he's gonna return and judge the living and the dead and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he's King of Kings and Lord of Lords? What if he's right about those? If I'm gonna be prejudiced enough to just say, yeah, not for me, I'm taking a pretty big gamble on my intuition instead of looking at the facts. This guy said this and this came true. So as I started to read the words of Jesus through that lens, what I found was something incredibly profound. It's different than the Buddha. It's different than Mohammed. It's different from Marx. It's upside down. It's serving others. It's this world is not our home. I mean, it's radically different. And what you find in the words of Jesus is this assumption he had that we're all like the little dolls in the village and our world has been destroyed by a real villain named Satan. And that there is a real supernatural realm and there really are fallen angels called demons who came into this world to kill and steal and destroy. And that they delight in sickness, they delight in rape, they delight in racism, they delight in murder, they want to destroy. And that Jesus says, I came into this world to sacrifice myself so that all who believe in me can have a way out. God wants you to live in a perfect world. Did you know that? That's what he designed for Adam and Eve. That's what he wants for you. And that's what he invites you into. But he's given you this thing called a free will where you do have to choose for yourself. Do you want that perfect world? if Jesus is the one in charge of it? Will you humble yourself to receive that? Jesus in that promise of Acts 1-8 essentially said, I've come to set right what's broken in the world. And then he said to his disciples, I'm going to heaven to prepare a place for you. Now you go 
and make disciples. And as you go and tell other people about Jesus, you'll raise up a little girl like a Mary Mose who will change the world through healthcare. You'll raise up sons and daughters, other disciples who will change the world. And, and here's what's phenomenal. You look at where those Christian hospitals have started. You look at where the universities that have changed the world, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Cambridge, Oxford, all started as Christian universities. Uh, even Berkeley here was started by a Baptist pastor. The UC schools were started as seminaries. You can look all that up if you doubt me, please look it up for yourself. You remove all of that and you remove that in the last few hundred years, the human lifespan has doubled. Gender equality, while not there, is way further than it's ever been in human history. Our ability to read and write, these things have all followed where followers of Jesus have been. You can, you can trace it geographically, just like with Mary Mose. And so here's my question, if you are a follower of Jesus, do you really believe today that God still wants to change the world as much as he did through Mary Mose, as much as he did through those first disciples, through you, through me. And that we don't have to be super smart and strategic and figure it all out. All we have to do is run God's play God's way. Go and make disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them all the things that Jesus said, and he'll be with us to the end of the age, and he'll change the world through that movement. He always has for the last 2,000 years, and he always will. Empires will rise and fall. Movements will rise and fall, but his kingdom marches on. So if you're a follower of Jesus today, I want to encourage you and kind of reinvigorate you. God has important work for you to do at your school, at your university, in your neighborhood, in your family, at your workplace. God has important work for you to be doing. And when the world around us looks to be lost beyond hope, that's when it's the time for Christians to live like Christians again and to get back to the basics of making disciples and telling others about Jesus. With each of our different gifts, God will use each of us in different ways because God still uses ordinary people who truly believe Jesus to do extraordinary good. I'll tell you one more story about that. Um, it was a time that we can relate to because there was a global pandemic. The pandemic was called smallpox, a far deadlier actually than COVID, way more deadly of if you got it, your chance of death and, and also incredibly painful. So if you have a queasy stomach, you, you might not wanna look because I'm gonna show you a picture uh, of some kids and the one in the middle has smallpox. I'm warning you, if you have a queasy stomach, look away, okay? Smallpox in the late 1700s was literally a global scourge. 50 million people had died and there was no hope. I mean, hospitals as we know it mostly didn't exist. There was no ability, the way we take for granted now that we can get ahead of a disease or that we can treat a disease, that kind of scientific understanding did not even exist. Benjamin Franklin's son died of this. Many world leaders and their kids were dying of this and 50 million normal people had died of it. In the midst of that crisis, there was a pastor by the last name of Jenner. He had about nine kids with his wife and one of them, his son Edward, had taken to medicine. Growing up in a pastor's home, he was taught to read the Bible, he was taught to serve others. At age 14, he did an apprenticeship with a surgeon on his path to become what we would call a medical doctor today. Edward Jenner was gifted with an intellect and Edward Jenner, as he saw millions of people dying in a world that had no hope, he had this observation the dairy maids who milked the cows would get this infection called cowpox, which looked a lot like smallpox, but it wasn't deadly. And he started to notice dairy maids who've had cowpox and gotten over it, they don't get smallpox and die. And he started to experiment. He started to experiment with this theory that what if we can actually get ahead of a disease and prevent it entirely? And what happened in the life of Edward Jenner is that as he began to experiment, it became irrefutably true in his lifetime that people who would take his medicine would not get smallpox and would not die from smallpox. 
And for the first time, you look back through thousands of years of world history, you've got the Black Death, you've got all kinds of pandemics and scourges that will just wipe out a third or a fourth of the world. For the first time ever in history, a global disease was completely eradicated through the medical insight and innovation of this one guy, Edward Jenner, who by the way, in his entire lifetime, people acknowledged it by the end of his life, this has changed the world. He never profited a single dollar from it. People would send him letters and say, can we get some of that medicine? He'd send it for free at his own cost. He wasn't in it for the money. He was in it as a follower of Jesus to help people. And it's because of Edward Jenner and his findings that today you don't worry about dying from tetanus or rabies or yellow fever or whooping cough or measles or meningitis. You can be treated in advance of those things. And you, you, we live in a world, I know it sounds crazy because COVID was big thing to us and it is, but compared to most people in world history, we live so free from disease, it's because of this guy. According to the World Health Organization, he has saved more lives than anyone else in all of human history. You take the entire population of the US today, you double it. That's the low end of the estimate of how many lives this guy has saved. Now, what's my point? Why did he do all this? We don't have to wonder, we can read his own words. He said this, I'm not surprised that men are not grateful to me, but I wonder that they are not grateful to God for the good which he has made me the instrument of conveying to my fellow creatures. That's a pretty fancy Victorian English way of saying, I didn't do this, God did this through me. In his personal journal, Jenner once wrote this, the sacred scriptures, that is the word of God, the Bible, form the only pillow on which the soul, that's your inner person, your eternal person, can find repose and refreshment. Now in today's world, you might think, oh man, I'm too scientific. I don't believe in a soul. Well, if you're scientific, you know who believed in a soul? Isaac Newton, Blaise Pascal, Johannes Kepler. I could keep going and I do in my book, but here, here's the reality. Followers of Jesus who just said, I'm gonna serve with the gifts I've given where I've been placed have changed the course of human history. I'll show you what I found, just a summary as a researcher, it started with the hospitals. Why are they all Saint this, Saint that? Edward Jenner, Mary Mose, et cetera. Then I started looking into the universities. Wow, Harvard was started by the Reverend John Harvard. Oxford was started out of a church. So was Cambridge. And so was Yale and so was Princeton. And, and I start to realize, man, you take away these Christian founded universities, these Christian founded hospitals, we'd lose the scientific revolution because those scientists were at Cambridge and Oxford. And then I read the, their writings, Newton and Blaise Pascal and Johannes Kepler, they're followers of Jesus too. So we'd have to take away the scientific revolution as well. And I started to realize this, this movement that was started by this peasant prophet has objectively done more good for humanity than any other movement in human history. That's not to say there aren't weirdos and crazies out there who claim to be Christian, sadly, who aren't actually doing what Jesus said. But if you study the lives of people who actually did what Jesus said, who actually said, I'm gonna believe what Jesus said and did it, you'll find that they've changed the world. Here's a summary of the research that you'll find in my book, Jesus Skeptic. Ending slavery, Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., John Rankin, etc. These people were not casual Christians. By their own writings, they were fanatical followers of Jesus. The same is true with Mary Mose, who you heard about, and Edward Jenner. They're just two of many, and it continues today. Dr. Francis Collins, alive today, one of the leading geneticists in the world, became a Christian by studying the genetic code and realizing there has to be a God. Hospitals, we've mentioned. Universities, we've mentioned. The scientific revolution, we've mentioned. Education for all. Did you know that before, about 300 years ago, most people in history never learned how to read? The fact that you were just forced as a kid to learn how to read is an exception. And it's because you're in a culture where Protestant Christians a couple hundred years ago said, we want all the boys and girls to be able to read so they can read the Bible. That's why the word kindergarten, it's a German word, came from a Protestant pastor who said, we ought to teach our kids to read the Bible. And what I started to realize as a researcher and a journalist was, this is the, 
like the biggest story ever. Why wasn't I taught this stuff? I mean, why don't, why don't people, like you just got to put the dots together. It's all primary evidence. So if any of this interests you, my book, Jesus Skeptic, um, what's unique about it is it shows the evidence for everything that I'm claiming here. So when I say that Edward Jenner was a follower of Christian, uh, a follower of Jesus, I show you his writings. Blaise Pascal, you can see pages from his journal. Isaac Newton, you can see pages from his journal. The people who ended slavery called abolitionists, you can see their writings for yourself and see they were motivated by the teachings of the New Testament. It's not an opinion, it's, it's factual. And you can see it for yourself. Now, one thing I really wanna say, I'm about to wrap up here, but to venture, I, I really wanna say, especially to those of you who've been here for a while, thank you. Um, because uh, tens of thousands of people have now read this book. And um, I actually just at Easter got to baptize a retired medical doctor named Mary, uh, who has been a skeptic her whole life. And she read Jesus Skeptic and she became a believer. I got to baptize her on Easter. Um, There's a, a young girl who just graduated high school named Katie. When she was a sophomore in high school, she read this and it led her to faith. And the point I'm trying to make is this book wouldn't exist. I wouldn't have had the time to put all this research together if not for you. Because it's when I was here as a teaching pastor um, that I had the time to put all this research together in one place. And so I wanna say thank you to those of you uh, who were here during that time. And it continues, right? You faithfully gave and supported. And now there's a doctor named Mary and there's a high school senior now named Katie. They're followers of Jesus. Who knows what they're gonna go do as we stay faithful to run God's play, God's way, making disciples. He changes the world through us. God uses ordinary people who believe Jesus to do extraordinary good. And I'll close by telling you a true story of uh, just another ordinary person, a guy named Ralph Lucas. Uh, Ralph's a good friend of mine when I lived in Arizona. He's a firefighter, that's actually him. And uh, Ralph told me this story one day, we were at lunch, unbelievable story. Ralph was off duty at the time. He was driving around in his big red pickup truck, but he had his fire radio on and he hears over the radio this report of a child who's been left in a car. Uh, This happens in Arizona, sadly, far too often. Cars heat up really fast in the sun uh, and it's often fatal. Ralph hears the address. The car is at a gas station and he's about three blocks away. He slams on the brakes does a U-turn, floors his big red pickup, and he gets to this gas station. He screeches in there before any of the other firefighters who are on duty can arrive. The mom is standing there. She's holding this lifeless baby and she's just panicking. She's just weeping and wailing and everyone around her is freaking out. And Ralph's training just kicks right in. He knows exactly what to do. He yells to some people to go inside and get ice out of uh, the soda machine so they can cool the baby down. And Ralph immediately begins infant CPR. CPR, by the way, invented by a different follower of Jesus, but I won't go into that right now. (laughs) Now, if you've ever seen CPR on a child, uh, it's different than on an adult. You know, on an adult, you use two arms and you really have to use a lot of force to to move the lungs and the diaphragm. But uh, on a child, you just use two fingers right there on their sternum. So Ralph starts doing these rescue compressions which start to move the circulatory system and and hopefully start to jumpstart the heart. And then with an adult, you know, you, you plug the nose and you breathe into the mouth. You breathe your life, your breath into their lungs But with a child that's that small, you actually put your mouth over their nose and mouth because they're so little. So Ralph has his mouth over the nose and mouth of this lifeless baby and he's doing the compressions and he he can watch with his eye line and see when he breathes out, the little lungs rise up. And as a follower of Jesus, in the midst of all the panic, he's just praying to God, doing his training, saying, God, please bring this child back to life. Please bring this child back to life. And seconds pass and a minute passes and Ralph just keeps pumping on the little chest, breathing his breath into the lungs. And then he told me, he said, John is the most bizarre feeling, the most heavenly feeling I've ever felt in my life. When all of a sudden in my mouth, I feel this baby exhale and breathe back out. 
and he holds the baby out and the baby starts to cry and sputter and the baby's alive. And Ralph said, John, I, I will never, never again experience that sensation of a lifeless baby who I thought was gone and I'm praying and all of a sudden they breathe back out. You know, God describes his spirit as his breath. That's what the Greek word means, the breath of God. And he said, my breath will come upon you followers of Jesus. You're gonna go out into a dying world and you're gonna breathe life back into them. And 2000 years ago, he said, it'll start in Judea. It'll spread to the ends of the earth. Follower of Jesus, God wants to use you this week to breathe life into a dying world. He wants to use you one person at a time, one family at a time, one neighborhood at a time. And just imagine this movement of venture. If all of us actually believed what Jesus said the way that Mary Mose did, believed what Jesus said the way that Edward Jenner did, and God uses you at Stanford. He uses you at Apple. He uses you in your startup. He uses you in what might seem like a humble or you know, something like Mary Moe's where people look and they say, that person doesn't have a lot, but you just follow Jesus and he will use you. His breath will breathe the breath of life into those around you. God uses ordinary people who believe Jesus to do extraordinary good. If you've never believed in Jesus before, you can call out to him today. You can believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. He is eager to breathe life into the dying areas of your life. I've experienced that and I can't wait next week to tell you about the experiential evidence of if you will give it a try, how Jesus can change your life. He's eager to give you eternal life. He's eager to give you peace. And for all of us who know him, we wake up in this world because the work is not yet done. Could I pray together for you? Father, I thank you for this vibrant movement of yours, brothers and sisters who love you and have given their lives to you. And Holy Spirit, we would just invite you to stir up within us more radical abandon to you. Lord, we acknowledge that we get caught up in the American dream, we get caught up in fear, we get caught up in thinking we can't make a difference and then we miss out on just faithfully running your play, which transforms doctors, transforms high school students, it transforms sons and daughters, it transforms future voters and lawmakers. Lord, your solution to the problems of this world is to go and make disciples and then to teach them your new way of life. God, would you just reignite that fire in us that we'd be abandoned. We are part of the greatest movement for social good in all of history. May we believe it, may we live like it, may we be proud about it. And Lord, for the person who's here and they're not yet sure what they believe, I pray in this moment, Lord, you tell them, if you seek me, you'll find me. Would you give them the willpower to seek you, to actually seek you? There's no risk if you're not there and seeking you, but God, would you just give them the boldness to call out, Jesus, if you're there, I wanna know you. Use us to make disciples. Use us to change the world under your leadership, Jesus, we pray in your name. Amen.